So, uh, you know, within crypto today, there are sort of three interesting categories of uh, uh, base blockchains. There's the Bitcoin blockchain, which is optimized for security and decentralization. Uh, so if you are trying to redefine money, that thing better be secure and it better be split up uh, across lots of people. Um, there's the Ethereum blockchain, which is uh, optimized for programmability. So if you want to build a shadow financial system, you want to do derivatives, options, escrow, contracts, stable coins, prediction markets, all of these things, those need rich application programming interfaces, they are, uh, which, is a, which is a direct trade-off with security because the more programmable something is, the more doors there are into that system, the more avenues of attack there are. Um, and, the, but, and the more complicated it is, the harder it is to scale, but the more applications it can be used for. And that's kind of where Ethereum and dozens of other blockchains actually compete. Uh, but Ethereum is the best known. And then there's sort of this uh, sector of privacy coins um, which include like Zcash and Monero and a bunch of others, and that's all around replacing cash with digital cash. So it's anonymous, it's protected, um, but you can do some you can do some really cool things with cryptography, like with uh, something called zero knowledge proofs, where I can like pay my taxes, I can prove that I paid my taxes, but nobody other than me and the IRS knows how much was paid, mm -hmm. even though it's done in a public blockchain. Or you could build a voting based blockchain where each of us can cast a vote. Um, each of us can check that our vote was properly recorded and tallied uh, with exactly what we put in there, but nobody else can see our vote. Only we each can see our vote. And the system collects all the votes and gives the right, provably, mathematically provably right answer, but nobody's in charge. Nobody other than the individual who cast the vote has the ability to go in and change their vote mm -hmm. or count it or not count it. Um, so, you know, these kinds of systems can be developed in top blockchain technology. So I think that those, those are the three most interesting categories right now. Um, we will see more categories emerge later, uh, but that's sort of where the, the token field plays out. And great summary. The, um, with regards to tokens, and then especially in the New Zealand context, I'm curious, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, yeah. if you were a regulator and say, okay, here's the kind of environment, the policy re environment, right. Uh, strategy as a country around tokens, what would be some of the yeah, things? Yeah, so in the, in the US, there was, or even globally, it was sort of a free-for-all with ICOs, where people were selling coins like very liberally to anyone who would come along, and we suddenly went from no fundraising online to fundraise anywhere, anytime online. People raised ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, and now we're sort of swung the pendulum all the way back, where the regulators have said, well, this is a security, and everything falls back under the old school securities laws. And those are, those are extreme. So I think a lot of companies now that are building actual utility tokens are trying to sort out how this works. So, you know, in the U.S., we have like Verizon and AT&T and a few others, right? But telecom carriers tend to be monopolies or oligopolies. They're, they're not the fastest moving. They don't necessarily give you high bandwidth wherever you want it, whenever you want it. Um, and today, we have the capability, for example, to stitch together Wi-Fi networks. Uh, you know how everyone has Wi-Fi networks in their homes, but they leave them closed because there's no real incentive to open them up. kind of opens you up to hacking. Um, but you could imagine a world in which the Wi-Fi access points uh, have an incentive mechanism built in, where if I open up my Wi-Fi access point, anyone going by can use it, and their phone will automatically connect and pay some micro pennies using a Wi-Fi coin. And uh, I'll collect the Wi-Fi coin in my uh, network, and that will be credit for me, so that when I go traveling, I can use other people's Wi-Fi access points, and it's now all done seamlessly. And wherever there are gaps in coverage, entrepreneurs will say, well, I can make a lot of Wi-Fi coin by dropping a Wi-Fi access point here. So you could use a blockchain-based network to create a global distributed Wi-Fi network that would be very high bandwidth throughput, maintained by all the nodes, and owned by nobody and would be upgraded on demand just based on where, where there were usage needs. Um, now, to create that kind of a network, now let's say I'm a group of developers who creates that network, what I'll do is, uh, early on, I'll give a lot of, I'll, I'll, I'll program the network to give a lot of tokens uh, to the people who are providing the first Wi-Fi access points. So in a sense, I'm bootstrapping the network. And what I'm basically saying to them is like, if you're an early adopter, your Wi-Fi access, uh, Wi-Fi token is going to be worth a lot more later, and you'll be able to get a lot more Wi-Fi credit, or even sell it for cash. Uh, same way, if I was trying to compete with Uber with a blockchain-based network, the early drivers would get a lot of compensation in my new Uber coin, so that when my Uber beats the normal Uber, they'll be rich 
because they took risk early on by driving people around before there were enough riders. So tokens kind of can help bootstrap networks and solve the cold start problem that networks suffer from. But now in the regulatory environment we're in, these are all considered securities. So under securities law, I can't just distribute you a Wi-Fi coin or an Uber coin because I have to worry about did I comply with securities laws? Am I ripping you off? Are you speculating? And there's such onerous restrictions that it basically just kills the whole thing. So at least in the US, we seem to have gone from this model of like everything is a utility token to nothing is a, to everything is a security token. Uh, and that kind of uncertainty is making it very hard to innovate. Um, so one example that I think a forward-looking regulator could do is they could say, okay, when things have a dual-use case, like a utility token and a security token, we will err on the side of letting it be used for utility early on. Uh, we're going to work with the companies to have a clear regulatory framework. Uh, and then you could see a whole bunch of companies that want to experiment with utility tokens basing out of here. Uh, and bootstrapping large networks that could then eventually go on and compete globally because it is the nature of these things to be winner take all. So if we build a ride sharing coin that takes over from Uber or we build a Wi-Fi coin that takes over from Spark or Verizon, that's going to be a global network. So it, it's, this, is a, a, this is what's interesting about crypto. You can launch a, comp, a crypto company from here that can literally take over the whole world. There are no barriers to adoption in crypto. There's no language barriers. There's no app store download barriers. There's none of that. Um, so you, so if, if you had a friendly regulatory environment here, you could literally build the internet and financial system that runs the world 20 years from now, and instead of everyone here being a vassal of Facebook or Google or YouTube, you know, they're all using a New Zealand developed property, and all the people here who adopted those coins early on would actually be fabulously wealthy. Uh, let me give you the extreme example. The extreme example is like if I was a dictator for a day, um, you know, I would probably just go through the top 20 coins, uh, tokens on, on coin market cap in, in crypto, and I would figure out which ones have very high quality code, like uh, Bitcoin, for example, is very well maintained, but I'd find like a fork of Bitcoin that still has a really good developer base and is well maintained, but still relatively low price. Like the whole thing is worth a few billion dollars. I would secretly buy up as much of it as possible. <laughs> uh, and these are unregulated markets for the most part, so there's no disclosure rule. But you know, let's say the government of New Zealand buys up half of you know, a $5 billion coin. And then basically announce that we're going to start making this coin legal tender over the next decade. We'll slowly start weaving in the economy. People will pay taxes on it. We'll roll it into credit cards. People will start accepting it. You can bank with it. We'll pay interest on it. You know, just start making it legit and viable. Now, all of a sudden, you have a winner in the cryptocurrency awards. You've anointed a winner. You've basically said, here is a coin in a major country that will always take this. And it'll create what in game theory is called a shelling point for the rest of the crypto universe to coalesce around. So all the developers will start building for it. People will start storing value and wealth in it. People will start building on top of it. Uh, and that coin will end up winning the crypto wars very, with a very high likelihood. Uh, and it could be worth hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars. And as early adopters, New Zealanders would get filthy rich. Um, so that basically, uh, today, there is no government that has put its weight behind any cryptocurrency. Whichever cryptocurrency gets a legitimate government putting their weight behind it first will win the crypto wars. Winning the crypto wars is worth a minimum of $10 trillion, which is the value of gold, not even counting all the other use cases. And so if you're willing to be the first one out there and put your neck out there and bet on that, your people benefit. You're essentially the founding shareholders of that thing. Uh, and maybe it's not 50%, maybe you keep 10 or 20%, and the rest of the world splits 80, but either way, you've sort of disproportionately batted out of your weight. And the, the key observation here is a lot of crypto is just norms. It's like we're trying to establish, do you drive on the left side of the road or the right side of the road? Uh, you know, do you speak English, or do you speak Maori, or do you speak Japanese, right? We're trying to decide on norms. But these are financial norms. So if you are the one who establishes the financial norms for the world, then you have the benefit, the financial benefit of those stored assets. Um, so that is an example of how one could hack the system. And you have a tweet that says, you get paid for being right first, and to be first, you can't wait for consensus. That's right. Like, to, to, to make money, especially in a financial context, or to kind of win in these sorts of situations, um, waiting for consensus is expensive, right? By the time everybody, like we say in Silicon Valley, like if you want to, if you want, if you want to make a good, good venture investment, you want to be non-consensus right. 
right? If you make a wrong investment, you lost your money. If you make a right investment, you can make money. But if it's conventional wisdom, if it's consensus, then it's heavily competed. The prices are bid up. You're not going to make that much money. So you get paid for being non-consensus right. And non-consensus, especially in a technology context, means being first. So you take risks. Uh, and you know, this, is, this is trite and over-communicated, over but Silicon Valley does ha places zero penalty on failure, essentially. Um, because, that, because we know that uh, you're going to fail nine times out of 10, or even 99 times out of 100, but the one time you, you win, the victory is 1,000-fold, 10,000-fold, 100,000-fold. Uh, and that's just a consequence of us now operating in uh, virtual and intellectual domains instead of physical domains. Mm. Uh, we're evolved for the physical world where it's like, you know, one input, one output. Um, you know, you, you spend one resource, maybe you win one back. But in the digital world, it's very different. Uh, you know, you, you, you have almost unlimited upside if something works and you have very limited downside. Uh, you know, one of the sad things is it probably is just as hard to start a successful restaurant as it is to start a successful tech company. Uh, you know, the restaurant owner is working just as hard. They're working to the maximum number of hours that mm -hmm. they have, and they're putting all their time and effort into it. But one just has this, un but the starting Facebook, you have an unlimited market of 7 billion people, and you can just stamp that product out with no marginal cost of replication. So in the digital world, the, uh, the upside and the winners is so large uh, that there's almost no such thing as risk. And on that point about being first, I mean, how, what advice would you have as a culture within New Zealand, but also what advice would you have to entrepreneurs in terms of cultivating that, that willingness or that courage or whatever those ingredients are to go be first on something? Uh, at least in the technology business, like whatever the geeks are doing on, in their garage on weekends is what like the entire world will be doing 20 years later as a mainstream thing. So you sort of have to have a culture of tinkering, uh, experimentation, uh, following intellectual curiosity. You know, for example, uh, all of the weird things that you guys do in terms of environmental conversation, recycling, composting, uh, you know, all the strange little technologies that uh, seem idiosyncratic, you can see how those will eventually, the ones that work will be transported out to the whole world. Uh, but that is true all across technology. Um, the story of technology is, you know, one monkey discovers fire, and then you know, everyone starts discovering fire because they can, they can spread that. So the beauty of it is that just one person has to figure out how to do it, and then everybody can do it. Um, but you're not going to figure that out unless you have people who are obsessive tinkerers. It, you, ha you have to be kind of obsessive about weird things. Uh, the good founders tend to be strange. Uh, the, good, the good businesses all look strange at first. Uh, it's only in hindsight that they become accepted asset classes. So, for example, when Microsoft was first funded uh, before their IPO, um, back then people didn't used to invest in pure software companies. Uh, venture investors thought that you can only make money in hardware. What, you're just selling bits? You can't do that. People can just copy that. There's no money in bits. Uh, but then uh, Microsoft came along, and then nobody thought that uh, a pure cloud services business could be that big, but then you have Google come along, right? And up until then, venture capitalists wanted to invest in paid software, not free services. Uh, or it was a media company like Yahoo. You know, you, you made analogies to media to make money. When Uber came along, a lot of VCs passed because the belief was, we don't invest in atoms, we only invest in bits. We don't invest in moving physical people around. That's not what venture capital does, that's private equity. So every great business just looks weird at first. Uh, it, it breaks the paradigm in some way, but every terrible business also looks weird at first, right? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is true in humans, too. Like, uh, to, to, the, to the average person, a genius is indistinguishable from a mad person, or very close to it. it but it's, you know, there's a thousand of them, and 999 are crazy, and one is a genius. And the art isn't picking out who that person is, or, uh, or the environment picks that person out, or they stand out eventually. Um, and actually, many of those so-called mad people aren't actually mad. They're just mistimed genius, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it, it's just the nature of the beast that uh, you're, you're, you're going to have to uh, figure out um, where, the, the, where the needle is in the haystack. And that, that's just a process of constant experimentation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, you, see, you look at people look at Silicon Valley and they say, oh, it's so wasteful. Why do you have a 1,000 incubators? You only need y one Y Combinator. Why do you have so many 
investors, you just need a few. Why do you have so many companies? Most of these companies are doing useless mm -hmm. things. Um, there's no way to tell which ones are, are useful or useless until you run the race. It's actually where the horse track, right? It's like, why, why do we have horse races to figure out who the winning horse is? Why don't we just pick the winning horse and say, that's the winning horse, that's it. Only this one's going to go around the track, mm. right? <laughs> well, you have to run the race to see who the winning horse is, and you have to do it over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, and that's what these ecosystems do. They, they, they run races all day long. And in the New Zealand context, given that we're a small country, I mean, how do you think about that tension between running a lot of experiments and having a lot of um, what could be replicating functions versus kind of tripling down on a couple key winners or industries and the like? And how does that potentially look in the development of this ecosystem? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It's like, uh, you know, as an individual, uh, if all you do is trend chase, you will go insane, right? Like, oh, AI is hot, I better go brush up in AI. Well, by the time you get good at AI, it'll have moved on to autonomous vehicles. Um, so I think you're much better off following your genuine intellectual curiosity rather than chasing whatever is hot right now. The equivalent for a, a nation is whatever it is that you're naturally good at doing and have both geographic and cultural and educational advantages in doing, which somehow aligns on the world stage. And I don't know enough about New Zealand to say what that is, but you mentioned to me in one of our conversations, for example, that uh, Wellington has a lot of content creation, design, art, uh, production capabilities. So for example, if that was a nationwide strength, you could see, okay, maybe we should be looking at VR and AR kind of industries. Um, you know, the, the crypto stuff we talked about, you can combine uh, regulatory arbitrage with we're in, uh, you know, three hours from uh, the Pacific West Coast in the United States, so we have a time zone advantage, and it's English speaking and rule of law and non-corrupt and all that, and gateway to Asia Pacific Rim, but still from a Western host. So I think there's multiple places to play in. Uh, I don't know if it's a top-down decision. I think mm -hmm. maybe it's just a combination of uh, let's have some friendly uh, immigration policies for innovators combined with some friendly regulatory policy mm -hmm. for experimenters. Um, uh, and you just kind of see what bubbles up. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nobody sitting around Silicon Valley saying what the next big trend is mm -hmm. or deciding what it is. What they rather are is it's just a, it's just a good place for the witch's brew of entrepreneurship to come together. You, mm -hmm. you just import as, many, as much technical talent as you can and you sort of get out of the way. So I'm going to invite um, people who have questions. You can start queuing up at the microphone. I'm going to ask a couple more, shifting gears a little bit before we go to the questions. You talk a lot about happiness, and one of your tweets was, uh, a rational person can find peace by cultivating indifference to the things outside their control. Yeah, this is not popular because the, the current environment is to get interested in and outraged about everything and then signal your involvement as a way of sort of getting social validation. What you called as <laughs> signaling virtue is a vice. It's a vice in multiple directions. You know, one of the traditional virtues is you don't talk about your virtues, right? Because people who do that, they're, they're signaling a little too hard and then it's a, it's a holder than thou sort of thing. Um, it also, you can just get trapped in signaling. A lot of society is just about signaling. Uh, everything from both buying hand handbags to being maybe a little over the top eco-friendly, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, so really what I mean, the, 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 the tweet was, uh, and this was, all these tweets are to myself, fundamentally, right? I'm just talking to myself, so if it doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. But I, I'm basically saying, I'm reminding myself that there's a few things in life that I, I care about, and there's a few things in life that any of us can like truly, passionately, deeply care about, things that we want to change and affect. And you kind of want to focus on those and not get distracted by caring about everything that comes along. Because we're evolved to live in tribes of 150 people. Uh, we're not meant to have all of the world's breaking news and emergencies packaged up into clickbait news, attached with graphic images and videos, and delivered to us with your phone buzzing in your pocket. And while I'm saying this, my phone is buzzing in my pocket, right? That might be Twitter alerting me to something horrible that's happening somewhere in the world, uh, right? You, you're just not meant to take on the entire world's problems all the time. Uh, it'll just destroy you internally. Uh, I see that a lot here, for example, in the environmental crusade. Uh, there's a lot of people here who care a lot about the environment and they're developing technologies and they're fighting hard to save it and that's all great. But just make sure you don't ruin your happiness stressing over every little thing that's wrong with the environment because you can't fix it all. Uh, and if you, if you destroy yourself in the process, you're just going to drown and you can't, you can't help people. 
while you're drowning. I mean, one of the problems I have with the modern environmental movement is it is, in, it is a culture of pessimism. Uh, and uh, that does not appeal to people. It's, it's a culture of fear. And I would rather appeal to people through greed and optimism, you know, which people respond to. <laughs> like, just imagine how, like, let's, let's, let's show you, instead of saying the world's going to end unless you do what I say, and then, you know, someone will tell me a thousand ways it's going to end, and I acknowledge all thousand, and they're like, well, I got another thousand, I got another thousand. Did you hear about this one? Well, okay, let's, let's start small. Can we clean up this river? Can we... Uh, you know, reforest this area? Can we make this person's life better? Uh, so I, I just think that you have, you really have to be indifferent uh, and not in a reactive way, not in a, I, I must be indifferent, just, but just by realizing that if you take on all the world's problems, it will destroy you. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in uh, a thousand years ago, if you saw a murder, that was a big deal. If you saw a dead body, that was a big deal. People would talk to you about it for months or years while you tried to get over the trauma of that. But now you turn on the TV, by the age of 18, you've seen thousands of graphic murders. Where is that energy being stored inside of you, right? That's, that's uh, damaged your psyche at some deep level. It's desensitized you, right? In some ways, we are desensitized to the horrors and then we are constantly being oversensitized with just this wave of news just constantly coming in. Uh, and you have to be okay with saying to people, like, I've got my thing, I'm working on it, I'm solving that problem. You've got yours, fantastic, I'm glad you're solving your problem. But I can't take on all the world's problems, otherwise I become a problem. But, but on that point, I mean, you're extremely well read and you're in touch with a lot of these exponential technologies and the risks, whether it's AGI or the environmental crisis or synthetic biology and the like. And so how do you, how do you reconcile that kind of recognition of how enormous, not just the headlines, but how enormous at a deeper level the risks are to everyone, um, and at the same yeah. time maintain that equanimity? I, I think it's, if you just look at history, look, we got, we got here, all right. Um, the world is not perfect, but it's better than it used to be. I know that there's a lot of habitat destruction, but uh, I grew up in India just long enough to see what the average person lives like. Um, we're extremely lucky. Uh, the average poor person is getting better off. Uh, you know, there's good news too. It's just, you, you can cherry pick. This is why I don't like reading uh, macroeconomics or history, because just depending on which data points you pick, you can weave whatever narrative you would like. Um, and I'm not saying that one has to be a blind optimist, but I think it's rational to see that as a, the, the, the average individual human's life is getting better as time goes on. Average, right? Not always. Uh, not across all domains and disciplines and times, but uh, we, we are better off than we used to be as a species. Now, the Earth may be more vulnerable, but even there you can see that rich societies, wealthy societies, start caring about the environment. Uh, and people are becoming more and more environmentally conscious with every day. I think the percentage of people that are environmentally conscious, for example, is not going down, it is going up. Mm. Uh, so I think the trend lines are in the right direction. Uh, and if you want to be effective, if you actually just want to make a difference, uh, you need your mind rested, you need to, your body rested, you need to be capable. Uh, and that's not going to happen if you're just frantic about everything. Um, maybe it's just because I'm old, so I'm desensitized now, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and I've also been around long enough that I've heard the end of the world thing so many times that even when I say it, and there's a podcast coming up where I talk about it and how, how all the different ways the world could end, I'm actually not that worried about it. The human race is, seems to be pretty, pretty good at figuring these things out. Uh, but, and, but part of the reason why it's good at figuring these things out is because certain people do get alarmed at it. Mm. It's just, I'm not going to get alarmed over every little thing. I'm going to work on my piece, you work on your piece. I mean, when I see the, uh, now I'm going to embarrass him, but I was at his house and he's trying to do a zero waste thing, where literally like every little thing in the house has to be composted, the, the tea bags are folded up and put away and reused, and it's, it's insane. I look at it and like, like, there's no possible way I could do this and function as a human. But I'm hoping you'll figure it out, you'll solve it, you'll systematize it, and maybe you'll help the rest of us get 80% of the way there. Um, because that's your mission and your pride and your joy that you're working on. It's, it's your tinkering. You're tinkering at the edges of environmental science to do that. Um, so I think if we each kind of stay focused on our task and do it well without stressing out over the whole world, we'll be more effective and we can actually make it. All right, let's open it up. The mic is open. We have 30 minutes. Hey, Naval. Um, I've heard you talk a lot about um, sort of what sounds to me like a kind of like conscious 
consciousness evolution. And I find that like such a really, like it's a very interesting question. And I think uh, Elon at one point was also asked something similar. Like, do you think that we'll be able to evolve ourselves through like what is now a natural sort of process of us learning through language, et cetera, to be able to evolve our consciousness. I'm kind of curious from your perspective, do you see that there's a way that technology can be, or that tech will be enabled for us to be able to grow our consciousness over time to like ex effectively accelerate that, 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 yeah. that, that process? Yeah, technology is a tool and it can be used for anything, good, evil, whatever, whatever judgment you want to make. Uh, you can use it to uh, increase our consciousness through, you know, the, one thing I, w I was surprised about uh, is the uh, is how the meditation apps are all doing really well? Like people are using Headspace and Calm and Insight Timer and so on, um, and it's becoming a thing. And technology is helping meditation. It was bizarre to me because for me the idea of meditation is like be quiet, dark place. I don't want someone talking in my head or telling me what to do, right? So uh, it almost seemed like technology couldn't make a difference there, but yet it has. Um, you could even argue like that some of the things that are making a difference in the consciousness movement, everything from uh, so-called plant medicines to yoga, these are ancient technologies that are just becoming more prolific, they're becoming more widespread, uh, but they're becoming more widespread as a consequence of technology. Uh, it's, it feels like everyone in Silicon Valley is going to Peru for mysterious reasons recently, um, you know, but that's facilitated by a technology called airplanes, another technology called the internet. So these are, these are tools. Um, in terms of like, is just technology itself going to raise human consciousness. I've seen some interesting experiments. There's this artist, Android Jones, who, who's doing a lot. Um, there are definitely people who are doing things like with brain adaptation, uh, brain wave scanners. Uh, there's this fantasy of this thing called wire, wire heading, which is really scary and interesting. Uh, there's a Stanford lab working on this. And wire heading basically says, well, your brain is just electrical signals. Uh, what if I can put a little headband on your head and uh, give you the electrical signal to be happy right now. Uh, and it's consequence free. It's not like a drug where you have to take it and it has to hack its way through your system and go through various enzymes and overload your liver and then some small amount across the blood brain barrier. No, I literally just go and change the dials and now you're happy. And you're like, well, that doesn't feel right. I need some meaning in my life. Okay, great. Now you have meaning. <laughs> but I need love. Great, love. <laughs> what else do you want, right? So uh, technology and, and it sounds really far-fetched, but it's actually not. They've already done wireheading on monkeys to the, for, the, for the bliss machine, the bliss box, not the meaning box. Uh, but right now it involves drilling a hole in your skull, so it's not quite ready for prime time. But you can imagine the technology will start giving us these answers. Uh, another extreme example is, uh, you know, in Roman times, one of the ways that you kept the masses from fighting each other all the time was you had bread and circuses, right? Very famously, you, you give them some bread, you give them some entertainment, they're busy, keep them out of trouble. Luckily, modern society, we're very enlightened. We don't have to, we're not gonna be fooled by such things. So we have cannabis and video games and Netflix, right? Which are the advanced technological versions. Um, I guess it's just a long-winded way of saying technology is a tool. You can use it for anything. Uh, you can use it for consciousness. You can use it for unconsciousness. Social media uh, brings people together uh, to form digital mobs to fight each other, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it, can, it can play on both sides. Um, and as I said in the morning, unfortunately, I think that in many cases, the destructive power of technology arrives before the creative power. Uh, but the creative capabilities of technology are actually unlimited. Whereas the destructive is, you know, it's, it's limited downside. You know what happens when you destroy something. Whereas when you create something, it's almost impossible to predict the levels that it could go to. Uh, no one sitting around in, you know, in Jesus' time, for example, could have predicted anything of what's going on here today. It would be impossible. Uh, because the way you can just combine and recombine and recombine and create life and civilization is, is unlimited. Um, but if you want to talk destruction, that always ends the same way. It's just barren. Um, all right, next question. Kia ora. Kia ora. We in the room um, have, you know, we're all mostly focusing in the right direction and we're collaborating, and, but sometimes we find ourselves in competition. So can you speak to different kind of ways that we could think around cooperating while we're trying to compete for the same grant or mm -hmm. trying to compete for the same investor where we're actually trying to compete against a new way 
of change in the way the market's trying to think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think the, the best, it's a competition is this terrible trap you can fall into. Uh, a lot of it comes through, you know, if you read your René Girard, he's this French philosopher and polymath, and he talks about mim mimetic theory, which is most of your desires uh, are actually mimicked from the people around you at a very young age. And you take your cues from other people in terms of what to desire, what to go for. And the explicit forms of this are advertising, but the implicit form could be, I went to law school, I see everyone competing to get that law clerkship with that Supreme Court justice, and so I believe that's the highest calling, when actually the correct answer for me might be to go be a food entrepreneur. But I'm just not even thinking about it because I'm in law school surrounded by law students. So there's a way of getting sucked into competition by looking around you. And the way to escape competition is through authenticity. Because no one can compete with you on being you. No one can compete with your business on doing what it uniquely does. The more authentic, and this is, this is the beauty of the internet. The internet enables you, no matter how strange or odd or weird or specific you are, to find your tribe. Uh, you, know, you, can be the, you can be obsessed with Legos as an adult, and I, and I guarantee you there are enough Lego collectors out there on the internet that you can make a fortune just collecting and building Legos. So I, I think the most successful entrepreneurs are extremely authentic to who they are and what they uniquely can do, and as such, they don't really operate in competition. And I've learned this the hard way, because I'm actually a very competitive person. So when I was doing my earlier career in Silicon Valley, I used to focus on my competition a lot. So one of, my, one of the companies I started was called Epinions. And we did product reviews on the net, and they turned into this online comparison shopping site uh, where you could go and compare prices. And our fierce competitors were BizRate and uh, Nextag and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Price Shopper and I forget all the names. There were about seven of them. And we competed fiercely. And it was just completely wasted time because it turned out that all retail got won by Amazon, and uh, all the reviews that we were working on, we should have gone local instead of online price comparison. But because we were focused on competition, we actually did the wrong things. Uh, whereas if we had been authentic to what we were really focused on, which was reviews and stuck with that, maybe we would have been Yelp. Uh, and that entire market just disappeared. And actually, all those founders are now my friends because we commiserate over our experiences <laughs> together. So competition is sort of this, it, 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 can, it can suck you in into thinking it's the reality, but it's actually not a reality. And the easiest way to see that is uh, think of any human being that you know. It could be any single person you know. Now think of if that person was not in your life, who would be the substitute? Who would provide the same demeanors, the same intellect, the same insight, the same behaviors, the same emotional support, the same action? The answer is no one. Every human being is so unique that there is no substitute for them whatsoever. And parents who have had children see this, right? Like you have three kids and they're all completely different. Like where did that come from? Uh, so companies are the same because companies are just collections of humans. So if you're competing, you're kind of establishing a similarity to each other that doesn't actually exist. And I think con even consumers and customers are starved for authenticity. They're looking for brands that are unique that are authentic to the founder, that are expressing something that they can't find elsewhere. People, you know, people don't want to go to Starbucks for their coffee. They want to go to the local, unique, you know, every time you walk into a store now, you look to see what's different and what's unique about that, st that store. And I think that's a consequence of wealth, it's a con consequence of taste, it's a consequence of technology, consequence of individualization. But we're coming out of a factory-based industrial world that was built in the 1800s where one size fits all for efficiency reasons, and we're heading into a boutique artisanal world where seven billion people will want seven billion products. So I, I, I'm not, I, I would say that yes, competition is a real thing, it does exist, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it actually exists more in fake human-made games, like sports and politics where for one person to be above, another person has to be below. Right? Those are status games. But when it comes to actually creating new things, whether it's ideas or writing books, uh, here's another example. No two authors compete with each other. Okay? You, can't, you can't take a book and substance, because these are authentic self-expressions of who the author is. Uh, and I think all products are headed that way, and all services are headed that way. You do not want to compete. You want to be a market of one. Kia ora. Uh, so my question is really around the fact that 
the capital markets and the financial markets need to evolve. And I know that you know generally things are getting better for some people, but the growth between rich and poor is actually growing, at least in New Zealand. And what do you think that next evolution of the capital markets is? What is a thing that is actually going to be the step change that we need yeah. to bring everyone along for the ride? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that's uh, necessarily a consequence of capital markets that the mm. divide is growing. I think it's a natural consequence of technology. And this is the unpopular thing to say because you know, I'm supposed <laughs> to sit up here and say te how great technology is, and it is. But technology is a form of leverage, and it's the ultimate form of leverage. Uh, it, uh, if I'm a programmer, what people don't realize is I have uh, a, a million robots working for me. If I come up with an idea, I code that idea up, now there are a million robots who will carry that idea. They're just, they're just sitting in a data center for heat and efficiency reasons and space reasons. They're loaned to me by Amazon.com, who takes a little cut with Amazon Web Services. But that leverage means that uh, if I decide on the right thing to do versus the wrong thing to do, I can make $100 million or $0. It's a wide swing. Whereas for someone who is not leveraged through technology, they don't have that force multiplier. Um, so someone who's working in a traditional industry does not have that force multiplier. Um, so I think you, you, when we talk about the distribution of capital, we're used to thinking of money as the main source of capital. Uh, and before that, the main source of capital used to be people, how many people are working for you, right? That's why like, uh, older individuals in society tend to be really impressed by how many people are working for you. And people who are a little more savvy are like, how much money are you managing? Or how, what kind of revenue are you doing? But really, the correct question is, how many robots are working for you? How many programmers are working for you? How many machines are working for you? Because those are the ultimate force multiplier. So I believe that the way out is through technology education. Uh, and where technology education falls down is that it's really popular to uh, preach education for kids. Everybody wants to educate kids. Uh, why? Because kids can't talk back. They have no choice. Go to school, sit down, shut up, and learn. Uh, but what about adults? Uh, we have this myth that adults can't be educated. Adults either self-educate or they can't be educated. We have this myth that if you're 45 years old and you lost your job, uh, your factory shut down, that you're done. Your, your only options now are either you're destitute and we have to figure out how to bail you out uh, as society, or uh, we have to somehow preserve your job uh, through some false tariffs or barriers to trade or whatever, tax breaks for some company, even though that the world doesn't need you to do that job anymore. Uh, really, I think we need to have a culture of adult education. Uh, what if we had a model where every four years you were expected and it was socially and culturally acceptable and there was a financial support that you would go to school for a year? So every, uh, you know, after every four years, you say, okay, now it's my school year, and this year, uh, you know, I'm going to go and learn about, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to learn electronics. Like, that's the thing that I'm going to learn this year. And you spend a year going to school learning electronics, and you can be 54 years old, and you're learning electronics. And I think that should be a valid part of society. Uh, we need continuous education to be built into society, because the, the leverage that you're craving, the leverage that you're asking for, is actually permissionless. It's available to everybody, but it's knowledge-based. The, 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 the gate to it is not some banker sitting on a pile of money, although that would be good too if that was released, but the gate to it is really knowledge, and, and it's the building of that knowledge and the sharing of that knowledge. I would think that the gate is actually community and how you activate them around what you're doing, but it's a discussion for later. Sure. I mean, it's also, there's, there's many ways to get that out there. You're, you're not going to be able to learn that kind of thing without massive community support, for sure. Hmm. Thanks, Anna. Hello, thank you so thank far. You. Um, I'm hearing lots of talk that decentralization comes with some promise. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about collaboration as well. And there's a lot of um, goodwill and intent, uh, certainly in the room. We've heard a little bit about that already. Um, I'm trying to reconcile that with the statement you made earlier about winner take all um, when it comes to blockchain technology. Um, is, is that really the position, that it's winner take all? And, and if so, should I be talking to Arthur back there? Because it sounds like he's got some cool stuff. Uh, it's, it's winner take all in the sense that blockchain uh, technologies are really protocols. 
and protocols are how we communicate things, communicate information with each other. So they are winner take all by nature. Uh, for example, language as a protocol. Within New Zealand, people are speaking English and Maori and that's it. If I were to launch an effort to speak Hindi in New Zealand, it, it just wouldn't get very far. It's inconvenient. Everybody has already established English and Maori and they want to communicate in, in those tongues. Um, so similarly, once there is a protocol for money transfer or wealth storage in crypto, let's say that if that ends up being Bitcoin, um, you probably wouldn't want a number two. It can't get there. Um, but separate winner take all from ownership. Who owns Bitcoin? And the answer is nobody. Anyone can play in it. It's a level playing field. Now it is a meritocracy. It's a market, and markets can be brutal and unforgiving. Uh, they can, they, you know, they, they don't necessarily look out for the weaker elements of society. So there always has to be a human layer that is on top of that, um, because markets don't. They they have their own very cold and clinical definition of fairness. Uh, but what they bring is they bring efficiency, and in the case of a protocol market like a Bitcoin, uh, they at least bring uncorruptibility. Um, they, you know, there's there's not going to like in a Bitcoin economy, if the bankers crash the economy and hold us all hostage, they don't get bailed out. We don't need them anymore. Um, so it gets rid of some of the worst excesses of crony capitalism, but it is not in itself fair. It is winner take all, but it's winner take all for a protocol. To give you examples of other winner-take-all protocols, TCP/IP, which underlies the internet, SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which runs email. Uh, the, you know, the, these are winner-take-all protocols, but we're okay with that because they're decentralized. They're not owned by any entity. On the other hand, if I look at a protocol like the App Store on our phones, that's owned by Google and Apple. That's not an open system. I hope that someday that will be replaced by an open protocol because those two companies just have far, far, far too much power. Uh, it's funny to me how people worry about Facebook, but when Facebook, one of their apps was leaking information, uh, Apple uh, kicked them off the app store instantly, all their apps. Everybody in Facebook was scrambling. That tells you who's really in charge. It's Tim Cook, it's not Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, that app store is the critical access point into the entire technology ecosystem. Uh, and the fact that that's owned by private companies means that all of the means of leverage, now this is where Karl Marx would have a field day. Karl Marx today <clears throat> would not be attacking uh, the people who own the money or the machines, they would be attacking the people who own the gateways to the app stores uh, because that's where the means of production are, re are really gated. Um, I mean, they get 30% they get of everything on your phone, which is your entire life, and they get it all in profit. It doesn't cost them anything for that 30%. Um, so I think we, even in a decentralized world, we can converge upon protocols that are winner-take-all for certain use cases. But as long as they're not owned by a single entity, uh, we're, we're fine. Thank you. Kia ora, uh, Naval. Uh, you don't really strike me as a busy guy. Um, I was wondering if you had an extra two hours in your week, um, how would you spend that if it was towards advancing the human race? Uh, yeah, I'm not a busy person, actually, uh, and I'm not busy because I refuse to schedule things. <laughs> I'm famous for not scheduling things and not doing meetings and not being in a specific place at a specific time because I think busy is the death of productivity, uh, and, and people will spend a lot of time uh, responding inbound to meeting requests and uh, notifications uh, and squander all of their time and energy, uh, whereas if you want to accomplish anything in life, it gets done through focus. Uh, intent and focused action. Uh, and that only happens when you have free time. You have to get bored before you can be creative. Anyone who's ever done a creative job knows you have to be bored. You cannot be creative on schedule. You can't be creative from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., you know, five days a week. Uh, you cannot be creative when you've just run from meeting to meeting to meeting, from to-do to-do to-do, to, 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 uh, from task to task to task. So, uh, and all the great endeavors in life are creative, right? Uh, at some level, I, I do firmly believe that everything I've done in life is useless. Uh, you know, it's not going to bring me any lasting satisfaction or peace, and it doesn't follow me to the grave, so it's kind of pointless. Uh, I, so if I'm going to do it, do it for the art of it. Do it because you enjoy it. Do it for its own sake. Do it for self-expression. Uh, and so uh, just, it's very important to not be busy. Uh, how would I spend two extra hours? I'd probably just play with my kids. To be honest, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't believe in work time. I just believe in like you have time and you spend it doing what you want to do it, and sometimes you spend it doing what you have to do, and you want to minimize that. Uh, and if you have to do something, you might as well enjoy it because you're still there and it's your time. 
you know, so why, why suffer? Um, but just sort of avoid getting into situations where you are sacrificing today for some imagined tomorrow, because tomorrow doesn't exist. It's just today is here. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't have unfree time, um, and I would encourage all of you to just be ruthless about not scheduling. You will have to disappoint people. You will have to disappoint society. Um, you will have to let people down, but when they want your time, that's their problem, not yours. Uh, and the best way for you to give them your time is to spend your time doing what on only you can do and most uniquely do. And then that is a <laughs> gift to the people who need that. Um, but you cannot be reactive. You cannot respond. Um, you have to act from inside, if that makes any sense. Sorry, I got, I got weird there. But. Yeah, I'm very defensive of my time, and uh, you know, as these guys know, like they've been tr even at Welcome Week, right? Well, you I've didn't show up to this on time. <laughs> well, I've, I've probably been the hardest person to corral at Welcome Week because I need four to five hours of time a day by myself doing nothing. Because if I don't have that time, then I will not be able to do anything. Because, because I mean, think about your days. Like if you get up at 7 in the morning and you run around, you're going meeting, conference, meeting, conference, conversation, then you come home, you watch a little TV, you read a little book, you talk to the family, you're exhausted, you hit the bed. Like, what actually got done? You, you're, you, you, haven't, even, you haven't even detoxed from all this, the crap you took in that day, <laughs> right? It's all just weighing in your mind and some of it is lodged in there and that comment she made and that thing he did and oh, I'll sort that all out later, it's probably on a therapist's couch 10 years from now, uh, <laughs> right? Um, you have to process your day, you have to let it go, mm. let it pass through you, and then you have to get a little bored, and then what's left, you're kind of tinkering and something interesting may come out of that. Um, we On need that, that note, we have seven minutes and 50 seconds yeah. to the next question. Exactly, 7.49. <laughs> Hi, kia ora. Kia ora. Um, I agree with you that the big challenge is education. We have billions of people who cannot participate in a discussion at this level, and technology can be the answer. How far we are of a self-engaging platform for kids or adults to keep their education going at uh, scale or free? Yeah, we're very... And, and, sorry, and which initiatives do you see that are, are yeah. around that could follow? Thank you. We're very, very close, actually. Uh, I think the bigger problem that this generation will face is adult education, not children's <coughs> education. Mm -hmm. uh, children are learning machines, and they just need the tools. Uh, and the tools are there, they're just unevenly distributed. So you could, there was an experiment done in Pakistan where they, uh, maybe it was, I might be getting the details wrong, so someone looked this up, but there was an experiment where they took a bunch of Android tablets and they left them in some poor village in a third world country and the kids unpacked them and hacked them and reprogrammed them and figured out how to use them and were teaching the adults how to do it. The kids are self-educating. You just give them the means, they're curiosity machines, they'll figure it out. It's the adults that are the bigger problem. And I think there, again, the, the, the means are there. The internet is there. MIT courses are there, Yale courses are there. I, I could even, you know, if you had a good software platform today and you said, hey, we're, we're ready to re-educate all the adults who need it, um, I need volunteer teachers. You could get a million volunteer teachers from the first world. But they're um, not engaging. So the problem is engaging. The problem is, the problem is the desire. It's the desire to learn that is scarce. And as we talked about earlier, desires are mimetic. Desires are copied. Humans copy each other's desires. So if you see, uh, you know, it's, it's the old Mark Twain line, there's nothing so damaging to one sensibility as watching a friend get rich, <laughs> right? It's kind of classic Mark Twain, but the same way, if you are an adult that needs to, that is facing a difficult situation, and right now, you're not thinking about education as a possibility, but then your neighbor goes and gets educated, well, that's interesting, right? Now all of a sudden you wanna keep up with the Joneses, so perhaps you'll do that. And the role for society and government might be carving out that space, saying, actually, instead of unemployment benefits, instead of universal basic income or whatever, we're going to give you a one-year education stipend, right? So here's the money to survive for a year while you get an education. Here's like 10 different educations you can choose from. These are what people in your neighborhood are doing. Uh, and also kind of reconnecting employability to education, like the, the four-year university system exists in this fiction of do what you love, which is fine. I'm actually a big believer in do what you love. I, I'm just not a believer in spend $400,000 in f four years doing, you know, l learning what you love. Like, because not everything can withstand that return on investment uh, and, and make sense for the taxpayer. So 
I think some combination of giving people the space and time to learn, uh, as well as mimetically making it uh, acceptable in society, making, making it great in society. Like, wow, you, you went back to school for a year and you got your degree in X, like that's amazing, right? That should be like a positive. Um, so I, th I think we can get there. I think we can do it. The, the tools are already there. The tools already exist. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, so with the talk about education, I often uh, listen to um, your, your um, suggestion on equipping everyone with tech literacy, and whether it's adults or children. Um, quite often, when we're going through becoming tech literate, it becomes very, very consuming because it takes a very steep learning curve for quite a lot of people, obviously. And then how do you balance it with, say, having four hours a day to be by yourself walking by the river yeah. so that yeah. you can be creative as you need to be? Because like, I feel the same way. So it would be interesting if you have uh, any observations. Yeah, learning isn't that time consuming, actually. Uh, I, I know that we have this model where you spend eight hours a day in the classroom and that's how you learn, but you're not learning eight hours a day. A lot of that is socializing, a lot of that is responding to the teacher's requests, you know, uh, a, a lot of that is studying things that frankly are kind of obsolete or you shouldn't be learning in school anyway. Um, when it comes to uh, actual technology literacy, I'll bet you like two hours a day for six months is really sufficient for most people. I'm not talking about turning everyone into a hardcore programmer. Uh, I'm just talking about enough that they're not scared of technology anymore, mm. right? It's like when my mom picks up her computer, not to pick up my mom, she's great, she's got an iPad, she's fully functional, but the first few times she's afraid of touching something, she's like, what if I destroy it? What if I, what if I delete everything? I'm like, oh, mom, you're just being crazy. You don't have to worry about that. And she's like, okay, well, how do I delete a file? Uh, I was like, well, you drag it to the trash can. She's like, then how do I eject this disk? We drag it to the trash can. Well, won't that delete it? Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> that will delete it, right? And so she has a proper fear because we have made technology still very complicated in a way that to the average person, they can make irreversible errors. Like if you hand your parents a Bitcoin key, right? <laughs> That's a high risk maneuver. Um, <laughs> So some of it is just we have to make technology easier to use. But I think the education is there to get over that fear. Uh, like whatever your level of mathematics proficiency is, for example, determines how much science you can learn. Like wherever your math tops out, you don't want to pick up a book past that because it's just gobbledygook. It's just like a lot of, a lot of jumbled uh, letters and numbers. And that's why I'm not a physicist today because my math wasn't good enough. Um, so I think the same way with technology, w w your, your knowledge gets you to a fear threshold. It gets you to a point, where the, the limit of where you can learn. So I'm not saying we educate everybody to be a, a great computer scientist, but we get them to the level where they're comfortable pulling a book off the shelf or going to a website and learning what they need to on demand. Uh, the beauty is that we have this external brain called Google and Wikipedia and WikiHow and so on. We don't need to remember everything. We just need to know how to use the tools to get the things that we need when we need them. Maybe just a, a, a point on how to balance it, though, with that uh, aspect of gaining energy that is outside of that particular area of literacy. Yeah. Uh, you mean in terms of the, the time, the free time piece? Free time or other nature, whatever it is that brings you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm from Silicon Valley where everyone's an egghead and everyone's spending all their time indoors. I, I think in, in New Zealand you have a much better and more harmonious relationship with nature. Um, I'm probably not the person to advise you on that because I spend too much time indoors. Uh, I, I, there is a uh, not too unrealistic uh, joke in Silicon Valley that part of the reason why people in San Francisco are innovative is because the weather is not very good, <laughs> right? The summers aren't great and like the beaches are actually cold and uh, et cetera. And uh, whereas in Los Angeles where the weather is really good and it's nice, it's actually hard to get work done because the outdoors beckons, but that's okay. All right, we've got time for one more. Uh, kia ora, I'm from Macaw One. Um, uh, we've got an amazing group of people in this room, uh, nonprofits, social enterprise, uh, startup people. What's your recommendation for them to prepare for fundraising in the future, and, and what do they need to know to be ready for that? Yeah, I can only speak to technology startup fundraising. I do not know enough about nonprofit or social entrepreneurship fundraising. Uh, the only thing I would comment on social entrepreneurship is if you really want to have an impact in this world, uh, it's better to make your, your enterprise economically sustainable. 
Um, so in that sense, it's you know you're, you get profitable even if even if you're a nonprofit, get profitable uh, because then you don't have to go begging for money. Begging for money sucks, uh, and uh, you know be a, be a profit center. And I don't and I, and it, it is hard, but when you do it, then you can truly scale what you're doing, and it can last for a very long time. Uh, in terms of fundraising for technology companies here in startups, uh, it's difficult because you're not in a technology hub. And uh, funding markets actually develop backwards. People think like, oh, I'm going to have angel investors and then Series A and Series B. But that's not how the market develops. The way the market develops is some company bootstraps its way to an IPO, creates a whole bunch of millionaire angels. Uh, then those angels, the smart ones, actually don't invest in seed stage companies. They actually invest in companies that are about to go public. And then those ones, then they form little firms and they invest in the ones that are just step before that, step before that. So you de-risk all the way back down to seed level. And when you see seed investing crop up in, in an area where there's no Series A or Series B or Series C market, then those companies run out of money very fast. Or you get brain drain where those companies, the winners get exported out and they go to Silicon Valley to raise money and they never come back. Um, the good news is that uh, Silicon Valley has gotten insanely expensive. And we've been saying that for a long time, but now it really is exp insanely expensive. Like, it might be twice the cost of Manhattan to run a company in Silicon Valley. So it's becoming much more accepted now for companies to raise money in Silicon Valley and then go back to their hometowns and spend it. Um, you still have the burden and challenge of standing out. Um, so uh, it might make sense to have a Silicon Valley or New York office with one founder or key executive there who can build relationships, um, so you can put to the, so you can be part of the trust network in Silicon Valley, which is really what makes financing and capital work there. Um, but then build a company here in terms of expansion. Uh, I think every large company in Silicon Valley and every venture investor is looking for the next place that has tech talent. Uh, and so to the extent that you have a strong university system, you have a digitally literate populace, you have young people coming up who are programming, and I hope older people who are programming, um, I think that's very, very attractive. Uh, so uh, in the Bay Area, it's now well accepted that, for example, University of Waterloo uh, in Canada stamps out all these amazing engineering students. Uh, Vancouver has become like a legitimate, acceptable hub to have startups uh, or have most of the operations of a startup. Same with Toronto. Um, there are a few of these kinds of places forming. Uh, and I don't, I, don't, I don't see why Wellington can't be one of those. Mm. Right? I think it just uh, it takes a little bit of focus and effort, but I think Wellington is well within striking range of being a great place to build a startup, and you just funnel the money in from Silicon Valley. That's a great place to tie it off. How do people follow your work when, and follow you online? Uh, I'm just at Naval on Twitter. So that's right. the easiest way. Let's give it up for Adnaval. Thank you.